Praise be to the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's uh, turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 1. And our text today is from 26 to 38. That's Luke, chapter 1, from verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Father, we want to thank you for the reading of your word. Now, Father, we pray that please add your blessings. Lord, help us, Lord, to understand, Lord, heavenly truths and apply it in our earthly context. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are familiar with this portion. Um, I just want to tell you that um, engagement. Now, Mary was betrothed in uh, Israel in the context, the Bible, biblical context in that time. Uh, and engagement was as uh, strong and as equally considered as marriage, except that the husband and wife would not live together. It would not have been sexually consummated. But in all other sense, in matter of principle and understanding, the man and woman were considered husband and wife. So there was usually a period of one year of engagement, uh, after which there is a celebration. The, the bridegroom with his party comes to the bride's house and that there is a procession that takes her uh, to his home. And so I'll, that is a one year of period of preparation. And usually um, in those days, the marriages used to take place quite early for the, for the ladies. You know, they would be after, soon after their menstrual cycle starts, ovulation process starts. Uh, at that time, uh, they would get married. So uh, it would be as sometimes as early as the age of 12. Um, I remember my grandmother telling me, my paternal grandmother, telling me that she got married at the age of 13, and I just couldn't understand it, uh, you know. But, yeah, that's how it was. So uh, Mary m must have been in her early teens uh, when this incident happened. Um, so now she is by, when you read about Mary, in the Bible, let me just be very clear, there is no divinity aspect associated with Mary. However, as a human being, she's a very honorable person. She was a person committed to the Lord. Now imagine a, a person who is in the early teens, maybe 14, 13, 14, 15, in that range of age, uh, you can see Mary is portraying a level of maturity that is quite high for her age. Where did that level of maturity come from? It actually reflects on, number one, the upbringing in her home. 
Her parents would have been godly people. Not only that, they had given importance to godliness in their home, but they should have been people who reflected the holiness of God in their lives. Because it is one thing that putting up a show of holiness, but you know, in your home, your close family, your husband, your wife, your children, they, there is nothing hidden between the, all of you. Everything is seen. They are able to distinguish between a show and genuine faith. And so if the children see you maintaining a certain standard at home, there is rudeness, there is, there is you know, uh, the, the true color of who you are comes out. And then they see you portraying yourself as something else in front of the public. The children pick that and they get discouraged. But looks like Mary grew up in a home where from the most secret chamber of their home, the most secret times of people in the function of the home and how that home functioned in the public, there was alignment. There was no hypocrisy. And so Mary not only heard the word of God, she saw it lived out by her parents. And, and this is the case in many homes, children that that get discouraged by faith from the faith and actually become rebels are the primary reason is because they have seen their parents behaving in a certain way at home and in a certain other polished way outside. And the children get discouraged with this hypocrisy. So praise God for homes like Mary's parents, where what happened in the home happened in the public, what happened in the public happened at home, there was consistency, there was integrity, there was purity, there was righteousness, and above it all, there was the growth in holiness in their home. And so this young lady from her very young age, she is growing up in the favor of God. Why? Because she is taking her faith seriously. It is not on face value. She is seeing it lived out. And she is living it out. And so she catches on that discipleship in her life that she actually now not only is the one who hears the word of God, but is actually the doer of the word of God. She is from her childhood walking in obedience and surrender before God. She caught it on very early in her age. You know, many people, many, maybe some of you are sitting here who are just playing with faith and saying that, let me just go in the journey of my self-indulgence for some more time. After some time, I will become a religious man. By the way, the Bible doesn't ask us to become a religious man and a woman because religion is man-made. If you follow a religion, you will be following man and man's method. The Bible do doesn't tell us to be a religious person. The Bible calls us to be holy as God is holy. The Bible calls us not to just to do some things to tick off a checklist, but the Bible tells us to live a surrendered life that we actually take on the character of God. And that's what holiness is all about. It is actually you are taking on the character of God. And how do you take on the character of God? You cannot take on the character of God while you continue to live in the indulgence of your life and to live as you please and to think that I am the master of my destiny and I will do it my way. Holiness does not grow from the holiness grows from the place of death. It is dying to self. It is in the place of surrender. It is in the place of submission. It is in the place of giving priority that you grow spiritually, that holiness takes place in your life. When you spend time with certain group of people, now you'll notice people who are migrated from, from here and sometimes they come back people who are part of our church and then they come back and those who went to Australia come back with Australian accent. Those who went to to UK, they will come back with British, British accents and all kinds of accents that they did not have over here. Why? Because their environment and what they, the people that they're spending time with, what they hear and what they start practicing, trying to conform to the standards and the ways of that place slowly changes their accent from what it used to be 
to where they are right now being influenced. So this is how it grows, the influence, the when you spend time in the presence of God and you hear his voice, your accent changes and becomes like God's accent. When you spend time in his presence and you give importance to his word, not only that you read the word of God, by the way, if you don't know to read, it is never too late, study how to read, learn, be a lifelong learner, get hold of audio Bibles. There are so many different ways that we can overcome different kinds of handicaps. If you are interested to know God and his word, take the effort. Spend time in God's presence. Absorb his word in because that is where the instruction for life. It is our life manual. When you buy a new car, the car will come with a manual. Many of us don't read the manuals of the gadgets that we buy and therefore we limit ourselves to the usage. We don't really get the benefit. My dad had brought, years back, he had bought a, a car with, you know, in those days, nobody was, it was just coming out, the Bluetooth technology and all that. So there is a few technology in the car and I see that it's never used. <laughs> I, I was also not really familiar, so then I took the manual and started reading and then started educating my parents as to the potential the car has. And they were saying, we spend so much money and we are just, we're not using any of these things. And many times we live our lives like that. We think we know it all. We ignore the manual that is given to us. We become the masters of our destiny. And we really miss out on life. Jesus said, I have come to give life and to give it in abundance. You know, we don't tap in, into that abundance. We are living in the very base level. <clears throat> Mary was, you can see from her life, from her conversation, from her actions, you can see that she was quite different. I want to challenge every teenager that is here. Not that you should go and get married at, in your teen days, but... Or the, my challenge to you is know the Lord your God in the days of your youth. Because when it is all been said and done, nothing else will matter but what you have done for God and how you have lived for him is all that will count at the end of the day. I'm not saying that you need to ignore your studies, your careers, or anything. You need to excel in those areas as a child of God because now you are not doing it anymore for your own glory, but you're doing it for the glory of God. You want to be a good citizen in this world. You want to be a responsible citizen in this world. But change your priorities, change your mindset, change the reason for which you're doing these things. Let God be number one in your life. Let everything in your life be oriented towards the maker of your life, the one who has created you, who has put his purpose in you. And it is only in the place of relationship with your creator and in submission to your creator that actually the purposes of your life get fulfilled. And there is satisfaction and joy. You know, I've seen people live through life and they come to a certain age of old age and they look back at their life and they say, what was all this about? You know, I have, I have no pleasure in anything. You go to the book of Ecclesiastes, you will see such a man. King Solomon, he tried everything. He went and indulged in pleasures. He went, did this, he did that. And then he comes and tells us that all this is vanity. And I love the way he concludes the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, in the writing of books, there are many that have been written. But in the end of the day, there's one thing that matters. Fear the Lord. Live your life with the fear of God. It doesn't mean that you need to be terrorized of God. Fear of God just means that you have a healthy, respectful awe of God. And keep that awe in your life. God is not your buddy. He is not your equal. Don't ever, ever try. I mean, I get so sad to see the casual nature with which the church today treats God like a buddy and like, you know, teasing God. And 
God is an awesome God. Have the fear, have a reverential fear. Have an awe of God in your life. You can see that in the life of a person like Mary. She was filled with the awe of God. She lived in reverence of God. There was the healthy fear of God in her life. You know, the, the sermon of, the, the title of my sermon today is Divine Peace. The word peace is not mentioned in the portion that we have read here, but you can see it actually lived out. Now, all of a sudden in her situation, Mary is going around her life. And all of a sudden there is an angelic visitation. What is her reaction? And now this is what the angel comes and tells us. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, what's her reaction in verse 29? But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of a greeting this might be. So first of all, she is caught by awe by the angelic visitations. Go to the Bible. Every angelic visitation was a terror-inspiring and awe-inspiring event. You see all, anyone who had an angelic visitation, they fell down or they, they, they said that I'm going to die. They were that scared. But you, you see why she was troubled. <clears throat> it is not only the angelic visitation that kind of threw her off balance, but the greeting. She started pondering about the greeting, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this must be. You know, as you go about your life, there will be people that you come across on a daily basis. And most of the time, they might be ignoring you. And all of a sudden, one day, they come and become very friendly to you. I mean, when people are friendly to you, you feel good, right? But there are some people who have never acknowledged you, all of a sudden are friendly with you. What is your reaction? You, you start worrying. You start thinking, what, what does this person want from me? A person who has ignored me all these days, all of a sudden is trying to be extra friendly with me. That means they want something from me. I'm in trouble here. <laughs> I think that's the reaction that Mary had. She's never had an angelic visitation in her life. Something that's happening all of a sudden. And then a nice statement. You are a favored one. Greetings to you. Um, she, she knew straight away there is something here. I'm... I'm I'm being pushed out of my comfort zone. I'm going to be pushed out of my comfort zone here. You know, these days we like prophetic words being spoken over us. And we actually go running looking for so-called prophets. Um, actually, the whole gift of prophecy as it is stated in the Bible is being abused grossly in a commercial manner today. The whole gimmick of prophecy today has become a, a, a comedy of commercial soliciting and soothsaying. You go in the Bible, study the Bible. Whenever a prophet came to town, people ran in the other direction. Because when a prophet came, he came with guns blazing. You evil people, you're sinful. God is unhappy with you. Turn from your sinful ways. And if there were personal words, uh oh, that was big trouble because it would be like, you know, what was the personal word that came to David? It came as a good story, but in the end it stung him as, as an as a arrow. You are the sinner. You are the adulterer. You are the murderer. So whenever the prophet or the angelic voice came, that's why people were scared. They knew, I am in trouble. When Samuel came to town, they, they sent the elders and the elders came and asked Samuel, Samuel, have you come in peace? Why have you come? Are we in trouble? That's the, that's the bottom line of the question. So please don't go around looking for prophetic words. All that you need is here. And if God has a specific word for you, it will come to you and it will come to you directly from God. Today in the New Testament, there is no longer a mediator between God and man except 
Jesus Christ. So God will not give an answer to your prayer to somebody else. That answer, don't depend on someone else for the answer to your life issues. The answer comes to you because you are a child of God. If I want to speak to my daughter, why should I go through my wife and through my son? I will speak to my daughter, right? And in homes where parents have to go through each other's or through the other siblings to talk to one of your children, that is bad news in that home. That talks about ill relationships in the home. When God wants to speak to you, God will speak to you directly. Whatever anyone else has to say that you have called alongside with you to pray with you, that would only be a confirmation or it would be a check in your life. If you are praying with a group of people and God has spoken to you and given you the answer and someone else has some other answer, it just means that you need to linger more time in prayer till there is clarity in the matter. So please do not depend on other people. Your relationship with God is direct. God has children. He doesn't want, he doesn't have, he doesn't have grandchildren. It doesn't mean that he, he, he has direct relationship with his children. You don't have to go care of through someone else. And Mary was such a person and the message came to her. And then what's the response of the angel? The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. When God's word comes to us, actually it comes to us on a daily basis. We should spend time in God's presence every day, moment by moment, so that we do hear the voice of God. Actually, the Bible teaches us in the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, pray without ceasing. Pray continually. What does that mean? Does it mean that you need to find a quiet place, kneel down and pray 24 hours, 7 days a week? That's not the picture there. The picture there is that you're going about your life, but each and everything you are living in the presence of God, you are living with the knowledge that God is watching me, God is with me. He is God Emmanuel with me. He is God the Holy Spirit who is in me. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, you are in a constant conversation with God. And I want you to learn to practice this, that in everything, acknowledge Him. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Entrust everything to Him and He will make your way to succeed. When you are in conversation with Him, you are rubbing shoulders with Him. His character is rubbing off on you. His counsel is clear. There is clarity in your life. From moment to moment, you do not even have to ask the question, is this right to do? Is this wrong to do? Because as you are talking to God, as He, the Holy Spirit is counseling you, He will not counsel you away from His word. He will counsel you within his word, within his principles, and you will be walking from moment to moment in the center of God's will. You know, people come and ask questions. Is it right to do this? Is it right to do that? That is at a very base level. Questions means that you have not grown. If you have to ask questions that is this right, is this wrong? It means you are actually finding a legal way to see how much can I push in the area of sin without actually having compromised in sin. So those questions in themselves are wrong. Don't ask those questions. Go to the word of God because if you are walking in fellowship with God, you will know what is right. You will know what is wrong. You don't have to ask the questions. There will be clarity. God will never tell you to go and marry a person who is an unbeliever. Why? Because the word of God tells you do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And so if you are attracted towards an unbeliever, you don't even have to pray. You don't even have to ask God because the answer is there, my friend. It's there with clarity. And if you continue on that path, God will allow you to go on that path. But you will make a mess. You will make a disaster. You would have displeased God and you will. Along the journey, you will pay the price for that wrong decision. I have counseled so many, so many families, broken families. And you go to the root, you will find 
some wrong decisions, some sin habits that was nurtured, that was not dealt with, some compromise against God's word that was not dealt with. And then this stays and it compounds in interest and it consumes people's lives. Sadly, we have seen marriages break down, families collapse, nations warring against nations. You compromise on the word of God, you compromise on his principle, you will pay the price one way or the other, one day or another. Do not take God's patience and his tolerance, do not take it as a license for sin. Just because he has not dealt with you immediately, do not take that as a license. See that as the mercy of God, where God is showing mercy to you and giving you an opportunity to come and correct yourself. Do not wait for the day of the judgment of God. Do not wait for the day when God has to discipline you. The Bible tells us, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Do not wait for God to humble you. I have heard people pray a dreadful prayer and they have prayed this prayer and said, Lord, humble me. You have no idea what you're asking for. Because if God were to humble you, my friend, it will be disastrous. The better thing, the wise thing to do is for you to humble yourself in the sight of God. And let God lift you up because there is no limitations to the exaltation that God can exalt you to. And in the same way, there is no limit to which he can humble you. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and let God lift you up. Let the exaltation be an exaltation that has no limits. Because your self-exaltation has limits. There is a limit to which you can exalt yourself. But when God exalts you and he says, good and faithful servant. Wow, what an exaltation it is. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And may the Lord exalt you. And so then the angel conveys the mission why he has come. Says you are going to bear a child. And this is no ordinary event. Jesus, the name Jesus is Yeshua. Joshua means the savior. The one who saves. And therefore, one who comes with that kind of a mission is not a man in the terms of man. The genetic code of sin in man's life had to be broken. From the time of the first sin, each of us that have been born after that, by default, we have been born sinners. Not because of what we have done, but the virtue of our nature is sinful. We don't become a sinner when we steal. We don't become a sinner when we commit adultery. We don't become a sinner when we murder. We steal because we are sinners. That's in our nature. We lie because we are sinners. That's in our nature. It's only that the opportunity was provided and we took use of that opportunity and we allowed the, the DNA of sin to show itself, manifest itself in an action or a word or in an attitude. We don't commit adultery we don't become sinners because we commit adultery. We commit adultery because we are sinners by nature. The nature is there and each of us is born with that. I mean, who taught the little toddler to be rebellious? Did the little toddler see the parents being rebellious and learn from that? No. The toddler has rebellion built into himself or herself. It is part of our nature. And therefore, the savior of the world had to be, when, he, when that savior of the world, who is God himself, coming as man, that genetic code that was written through which we have received the sinful nature, that code had to be break, broken. And therefore, it was broken in the physical birth, in the conception of Jesus as the savior. And Mary, now I want you to notice how the transition happens during the course of the conversation, how Mary's attitude 
and how her fear is gone, how she submits, and how that peace which led her to say in verse 38, And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. How did that person who was highly troubled all of a sudden through the course of the conversation become filled with divine peace to the point where she says, I am the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to his word. You know what has gone through her mind in that process? Why she was alarmed in the first place? Because she, she thought as a human being, as you and I would do. She thought, I'm only a teenager. I'm betrothed to this honorable, respectable man called Joseph. What is the society going to say? What is my family going to say? How am I going to tell my father and my mother that I have become pregnant and that too by the Holy Spirit? Who is going to believe me? Who is going to understand me? So she was caught in a very difficult dilemma in her life. She felt very lonely. She knew that even her parents and her siblings are not going to understand her. Oh, a tall story. I got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And they would be busily discussing with each other. Who could it be? Was it Benjamin's son? Or was it Joseph's son? Or was it Daniel's son? Who made her pregnant? So she didn't have any place to go. She was stuck. Her life was ruined in the normal sense. And she was such a respectable young lady who honored the Lord. And now people will start not only ridiculing her. They will start ridiculing her faith and say, oh, this is a fake believer. She, she was putting up a show all this time. But no one knows the call that came to her. No one knows the call that will come to you. When God calls you, God calls you with a unique call. Nobody else can understand that. Even your spouse will take some time to process and you'll have to wait for the, for the Lord to speak to her your spouse and to process this thing. So Mary was processing this thing and, and as she is processing, as she is thinking in her human intellect, in her human mind, there is no way out she can see from the shame, the disgrace. And in those days, what would happen to adulterers? They would be stoned to death. What a gruesome way and so she, all this is going through her mind. Uh, she is picturing herself, her family, her village citizens, her friends, everybody shouting, screaming, sinner, adulteress, pelting her with stones and dying an agonizing death. So it was not an easy call. It was not at all easy. But for that moment where the fear came, where she started thinking as a human, after that initial shock, she turns her attention to the God that she knows. You need to know God. Please don't just know about God, but know God. Job, an honorable man, the Bible calls him even God was testifying about Job to the devil and saying, who is like Job? And then Job is put to the test. And then you have Job's friends coming after he has suffered all the calamities of losing his children. In an accident, all of them died. Losing all his property, all the glamour, the glory that he had goes away. He becomes sick. His skin gets, gets festered. He is down in the ash pit. His friends come and start philosophizing. Initially, good things they were saying. And then when, God, when Job started defending himself and saying, I can't understand, what have I done to deserve this? Then they start pelting him with, with their words and said, no, you, you, how dare you, Job? How dare you think you are a righteous person? 
And I always love the conclusions towards chapter 38, 39, 40 of the book of Job, where God starts to now intervene. First, he blasts all of Job's friends and puts them in their place. And then he turns to Job, the most righteous one. <clears throat> and he's, he goes through a discourse with Job and says, Where were you when I placed the stars in heaven? Where were you when I put the creatures in the sea? Where were you when I put the creatures in the air? Where were you when I let the seeds to come up and become plants and bear fruit? And there's something that happens. The transformation goes through Job. He realizes that even as the most righteous person, he is not righteous in the sight of God. He repents. And there is a beautiful statement that he makes. He said, I knew about you, but now my eyes have seen you. God doesn't want us to know about him. God wants us to know him. He wants us to know him with intimacy, in the place of, of closeness. And that is the transaction that happened in Mary's life. She switched from that moment of thinking like a human being. to the, She turned her attention back to God and said, God, you are God. You are in control. You know, many times we say this statement in our life, God is in control. Do we believe it? If God is in control and you believe it, there will be peace in your life. There will be no agitation in your life. You cannot be agitated in your life and say God is in control. Then you have not known God. Please don't just be satisfied of knowing about God, but know God. Know who He is. Spend time in His presence. Obey Him. Submit to Him. Surrender to Him. Where did that switch happen in Mary's moment of Without, being, without peace, to the place of being peaceful, calm, tranquil, serene, and confident. The switch happened when she surrendered herself into the hand of God. God, I don't understand intellectually, but I know you are God. Intellectually, I don't have the answer, but I believe. And from the place where she turned her attention to God and recalled in her mind who she is in relationship with, she knew nothing is impossible for God. And she knew that God, if he, God has called me to a task, he has called me to this place. And the angel said it is a place of exaltation. By human terms, it's a place of shame. God will cover over my shame. God will convict my family. God will convict the people. God will convict Joseph. And that's what happened. The angel, when next visitation of the angel was to Joseph. And told Joseph that that which is in the womb of Mary is from the Holy Spirit, is of divine doing. Nothing is impossible for God and Joseph believed and Joseph aligned himself to heaven. A very honorable man. So what is this peace? Peace is not the absence of war or absence of strife. That was the Greek way of thinking. The Greeks thought that peace is the absence of strife and absence of war. It is not only the absence of war, but it is the presence of a friendly relationship. It is not just feeling good, but it is a sense of wholeness and completeness. And it has in it the sense of victory and prosperity. Not the prosperity of becoming rich monetary wise, but the prosperity of the soul where we are able to believe at levels that we are not believed ever before. If you don't use the gift of faith, it will waste away. If you don't use your muscles, your muscles will waste away. Faith is a gift from God. When you use it, it becomes stronger. And God will take you from one level of faith to another level of faith as you trust in Him, as you believe in Him. Tomorrow, you will be able to operate at another level that you are not operating on right now, today. Why? Because you have taken a journey with God, you have trusted God, you have gone deeper into God. And so there is victory, there's a sense. So at that moment when the switch happened, Mary was no longer defeated, she was no longer worried, she was no longer afraid, but she was filled with divine peace. She felt a sense of confidence, she sensed the sense of victory, she knew God is in control. 
She knew where her peace is coming from. You know, there is a lot of talk in the media and everywhere you will hear about inner peace. Don't look for that, that inner peace <laughs> because that is man-made peace that will go off the moment you are agitated. The peace of God that surpasses all human understanding is not the inner peace that we talk about. It is something beyond you and me. The source is the covenant relationship with God. If you are not in a covenant relationship with God, you will not have the real peace. And when you pray, one of the things, one of the mistakes that we make, and I've heard people make, and I've made this mistake. When we pray, we say that, I felt peaceful, and so I think this is right. And I've heard people say that when, for example, when they are in a relationship with an unbeliever, and they felt peace in their heart, and they went ahead to marry, God will never violate his word. He will not give you the peace when you are willfully violating God's word. And so if you feel an inner peace when you know you're violating the word of God, that is not real peace. That is a fake peace that you're conjuring yourself to convince yourself to go in the direction that is contrary to the will of God. So please do not use peace as a sign to answer to your prayers. Because when you pray and when you pray, when you talk to God, God will challenge you. When God challenges you and gives you an assignment, you will be troubled. Why? Because he's pushing you outside your comfort zone. So don't take an inner peace as a sign of answer to prayers because that is a is a sensation that you are sensing within your comfort zone. You are conjuring it yourself. You are convincing, convincing yourself. That is not the answer to your prayer. Also, peace is a commitment to the work of justice and truth. You cannot have peace, the divine peace, the true peace, without the truth of God and the justice of God accompanying it. They work together. The word for peace that is used in the Hebrew language is shalom. And in the Greek language, it is Irene. How many of you have the name Irene here? I think that name comes from... The name Irene means peace. If you didn't know that, that's the meaning of... It also comes with a sense of... This word comes with a sense of international calm and relationship of goodwill between God and humans. I want to leave you with this question today. Is there peace in your life? I'm not talking of the inner peace that we conjure ourselves. I'm talking about the divine peace that in the midst of your turmoil, in the midst of a problem, in the midst of something that is unusual, are you experiencing God? Are you sensing the presence of God? Because if God is not there in that place and at that moment, agitation comes in. If God is not present, agitation comes in, fear comes in. But if God, if you are trusting in God, your face is turned towards God, and you are able to say with Mary, I am the handmaiden of God, be it unto me according to his will. What Mary was saying, I am ready to go through shame. I am ready to go to death. I am ready to go to the ends of the world. I will obey you, Lord. What you say will go in my life. If you are in relationship with God, you will be challenged on a daily basis. You will not be able to live in your comfort zone. God will keep pushing you out of your comfort zone because he is growing the character of Christ in you. Music team, would you please join me? So if you are too comfortable in your life, please pray. <laughs> Talk to God means that you're not spending time in prayer. You're not spending time praying to God. You're not spending time talking to God. You're not spending time hearing from God because if you would hear from God, he would keep pushing you. He would keep pushing you. He would keep pushing the flesh out. He would keep making our flesh uncomfortable and he will keep challenging us to take steps of obedience that leads us into the character of Christ. Do you have peace today?
If you are agitated, if you are without peace, would you please remain back after the service? Come see one of our elders here and our prayer team. Not that we will impart peace to you, no. But we may be able to offer some counsel to you from the word of God and we may be able to stand with you and agree with you where you will make the transition from learning to tr trust God and not yourself. The action has to be from you, but we will stand with you in agreement. We will counsel you.